And I want to welcome all three of you. Uh, you know, thank you for being part of Kids and Art Foundation's four day uh, virtual summit fundraiser. Uh, Smitha, thank you for doing the morning meditation. That was really a nice way to kick off day two. Uh, we didn't get a chance. My to pleasure. Yeah, we didn't get a chance to introduce you, so I'm going to do that now. Okay. So, Dr. Smitha Garg is a San Jose based artist, arts educator, and accomplished holistic healer therapist. She is an active member of her community, volunteering for several organizations and serving as a City of San Jose Arts Commissioner. As a passionate advocate for the transformative power of the arts, Smitha has been working on developing practices that bring a deep level of healing, calm, and peace to anyone who follows them. She has found the practice of mindful breathing and meditation to greatly inform her personal creativity and art making. Recently, Smitha helped form Creatives for Compassionate Communities, an incubator for artist activists. Welcome, Smitha. Thank you. Next, PJ Hirabayashi from Taiko Peace and Creatives for Com uh, Compassionate Communities. PJ's Taiko Peace is a movement, mindset, and mantra dedicated to unleash creativity, spark new connections of co-creativity, and heal the human spirit through the dynamic energy of taiko drumming. Welcome, PJ. Karen, <laughs> Karen Altry PM from Red Ladder Theater Company and Creatives for Compassionate Communities. Karen is an accomplished director, actor, dramaturg, workshop facilitator, and acting instructor specializing in social justice theater and community access to the arts. Karen is the director of the Red Ladder Theater Company, a nationally acclaimed award-winning company which empowers marginalized populations in our community by helping them develop positive life skills through the art form of theater. Welcome, Karen. Welcome to all Thank of you. Thank you very much. Thank you for having us. So uh, for whoever doesn't know about Kids and Art, we've been here a Bay Area nonprofit. Our office is in Burlingame, California, and we've been around since 2008. That's when I founded the organization. And so it's, we've been running around uh, creating art at UCSF Children's Hospital and Stanford Children's Hospital for, two, for a very long time. However, uh, everyone's moved life and the way they work during COVID. So uh, we've changed and I don't like the word pivoted, but we have pivoted and we are uh, still there creating with our families where they need us, when they need us. So we have moved all our workshops on Zoom and we're also creating art lessons on YouTube so that our hospital partners can access them and share them with the patients that are in the hospital bedside. And there's a lot more to be said, but this is not about us today right now. This is about you. Um, we can share more later. So welcome and Smita, please take it away. Thank you. Thank you so much for that wonderful introduction. And I really applaud you. Uh, I applaud Kids and Art for doing this wonderful work. It's very important. Uh, bringing healing through the arts, I feel is uh, what we need more and more of at this time. So uh, with that said, I will call on my colleague and friend, Karen Altry, PM. Um, I have a presentation that we worked on and uh, I'm going to share screen. And the way we are gonna do this is we are gonna take a little bit of time sharing our personal stories of uh, how we got into this field of uh, creating art, doing art, and then uh, moving on to how we uh, came together to create creatives for compassionate communities. Um, so, and then thereafter, if there's time left, I welcome people to uh, pose questions and uh, hopefully we'll have some time for that. So I'm gonna share screen now and here we go. Okay. 
So, uh, Karen? Uh, great. Uh, thank you very much, Smita. Um, so, I'm, I'm happy to join you all today. I'm actually a little jealous of both Smita and PJ, which uh, you will see later in the uh, slides that they both have uh, beautiful images of themselves as children. So, they're probably going to uh, roll it all the way back to um, how they got started personally and creatively. Uh, I couldn't come up with one of me, so you just get where I am now. So, um, uh, as was mentioned, I am the director of the Red Ladder Theater Company. And uh, Red Ladder is um, a social justice theater company that is founded on the understanding that creativity is at the core of who we are as human beings. Fish swim, birds fly, human beings create. We use our imaginations and we make things up. and we know that when that creative impulse is supported and revered and nurtured, that's when positive change occurs. Likewise, if people are denied the opportunity to connect with themselves creatively, there is a, a missing piece, uh, I would say, because it's who we were meant to be, right? That, that the way that we view the world, the way that we solve problems, the way that we address issues, is all connected to uh, the creative person that mother nature created us as and intended for us to be. And um, by connecting with our creativity, we know that we are all able to develop the skills of creative thinking and problem solving, the ability to collaborate with one another, to be able to focus on tasks, to learn from our mistakes, to share our voices, express our feelings and ideas, and raise our self-esteem. And when we go through the creative process, we are actually developing um, neural pathways in our mind that allow us to think about things in a different way. We understand that, particularly in our case, the art form of theater allows us to put ourselves in someone else's shoes. Right, so that we can imagine a situation, we become the character that is in that situation. And inherently, we begin to understand about what that person's experience is. That uh, we can see through their eyes for a little while. And by going through that process of walking in someone else's shoes, we understand them and we understand ourselves better. Right, that, that that level of empathy for our fellow human being is built in that moment because we get a chance to be that. Likewise, if we are in situations where we aren't really sure what to do, we're faced with a problem to be solved, it's our creativity that allows us to see things differently. And that's why I talk about um, the forming of, of different neural pathways that maybe have not been there before. Every time we take the opportunity to try on another possibility, to see things differently, to tell a different story than maybe the one that's already been told about us, that sets up another and another and another and another possibility. And every time we set up those possibilities, we know that we are not stuck in the one way that maybe someone else thinks that something should be done. Instead, it gives us myriad options for the ways that we can solve problems. And so for us, uh, the kinds of participants with whom we work um, are people who typically don't have access to this kind of work, the kind of work that allows one to tap into their creativity. So we commonly work with um, homeless and runaway youth, pregnant and parenting teens, youth and adults uh, in the correctional system, uh, youth in the foster system, youth and adults with autism, people who, who typically uh, are told that creativity is not for you or it's not the most important or set that aside and focus on something else. And what we know is that when each of us is able to get back to the roots of our creativity, that is when we 
are our whole selves and can bring our whole selves to any given situation. For me personally, uh, when I began to, to do this work, gosh, I, I got involved in theater um, when I was in high school and it really spoke to me. Uh, it spoke to me um, both personally as a creative individual, but also for the sense of community and collaboration that goes along with it. One of the things that I love about the art form of theater in particular is that it really is a combination of every possible art form, right? That when you come together on a theater production, uh, there are the playwrights. So there's creative writing involved. There are the actors, there are the directors, there are the scenic and costume and lighting designers. And so you have visual art, you have literary art, you have performance art, uh, you have music in the sound design and the musical quality, the underscoring that's there, and more if it's a musical. And so all of those elements come together to be able to create a gorgeous collaborative art form. So I came from that as, as my basis, and, and I love the idea that we all have stories to tell and lots of different ways that we can tell them. And then when I went on to, to study in school and so many people were saying, oh gosh, you know, so how do I get an agent when I get to the city? Or um, they, were, they were looking at the business side of theater. And for me, I, I felt like people looked at me like I had three heads because I said, well, what if you're not worried about that? What if what you are concerned about is making sure that this art form that we are all fortunate enough to engage in is equally accessible to everyone and is a way for, um, uh, for us to connect with one another in the community and make sure that the opportunity is spread justly and equitably so that everyone's stories are being told and that it's not relegated to a particular set of people. I think that, that oftentimes when people think of theater, uh, they think of it as being an elitist art form. They, they think that it's not for them, um, but really at its roots, it is the storytelling of every person in a community and they are all given the opportunity to be able to um, share their stories, share their ideas, bring them to life on stage, and when they do that, um, the opportunity for them to be able to feel like they are seen and they are heard and that what they think and what they feel is important and gets echoed within the community um, is really an essential component. And so we know that um, when, we, when we come together at the nexus of creativity and our sense of compassion and empathy for one another, that's when theater is at its very best. And that it is also at its best, uh, not a spectator sport or spectator art form, if you will, um, but a participatory art form that allows everyone in our community, everyone in our society, ideally to share their voices. And with that, I will hand it over to Smita to tell us a little bit about her story. Thank you, Karen. That was really wonderful to hear. You know, I'm always amazed at the work that you're doing at Red Ladder. And it, it really feels good to know that I'm working alongside you and we are doing this together at Creatives. So uh, I will go down to my story and um, okay so my mom actually recently sent this photo of me <laughs> and you know um, I'm, I'm one of those kids who would have probably gone astray or maybe not survived if it weren't for art um, I was super sensitive I had very strong senses of hearing smelling very sensitive skin so i grew up being told you're so sensitive and um, i was born in new delhi i was born smiling apparently so my parents named me smita which means the one who smiles 
in my native language. And um, I found my refuge in art because I found the world so overwhelming. And it wasn't that I wasn't loved or cared for, it was just that I wasn't understood. And uh, that made things very difficult for me. That made school very difficult for me. Um, so later on, much later in life, I found that I had dyslexia all my life, which had gone undiagnosed, uh, which was also part of, you know, whatever group of issues I had growing up. So um, over time, I learned to connect with myself through art. So I have basically drawn almost every day of my life from the age of seven, because art was my way of connecting to my world and to the outer world. Um, school was very difficult. Um, for higher education, I attended art school. And the role of art in helping me get through my life has been so huge that when I was 18, I started to work with emotionally disturbed children, um, you know, doing art with them. And that sort of paved the way for my work that came later, uh, which is uh, in the field of arts education. So I attended the University of Illinois, Urbana-Champaign, got my doctorate in arts education. It gave me an opportunity to do in-depth research and work with children and understand their art making, understand reasons why humans make art and what it does for them. So I began to understand very deeply and a lot of what Karen talks about, the neural pathways, but also, um, you know, why, why do human beings do art around the world in every culture? So uh, that was something I really looked at uh, for my doctoral study. And I realized that art was closely related to the identity formation in children. And so um, after I finished my doctorate, uh, I moved to California. Um, it was in 2000 and I just had a child, my first uh, baby, and uh, she almost died at birth. And that left me very traumatized. In fact, I had postpartum for several years after that. But it was an accumulation of a lot of stuff, of the overwhelm I always felt, my sensitivities, everything just sort of started to affect me even more. And the doctor said, well, maybe you should go on antidepressants. And I was like, uh, I'm not sure. I don't think I want to do that. So I started to look at other healing mod modalities, like the non-invasive healing modalities, like uh, you know, meditation uh, or pranayam, yoga, even Reiki healing and uh, acupuncture. And I started to understand more deeply how um, you know, how our emotions connect to our body. And so I, that was a journey that started in parallel, my journey as a healer. And um, in 2000, I would say 2005 through 2017, I volunteered as an art teacher at my daughter's school because as we know, California public schools don't have art teachers. We are the only state with no art teachers. And so to me, it was really odd that how, how could children thrive without any arts? And what about kids like me who had no other way to find themselves, you know, uh, if it weren't for their art making? So um, I volunteered as an art teacher from 2005 through 2017 teaching at my daughter's school, uh, you know, and, uh, and it really bothered me that there was nothing happening to support children in their artistic development. And so I became interested in joining the Arts Commission. I got onto the San Jose City Arts Commission, um, of which I recently became chair. 
And I'm really sort of focusing on a lot of things. I'm focusing on diversity and things like that, but I'm also focusing quite a bit on um, making good quality arts education available to children. So um, in 2016, if we just go back a little bit, uh, I would say 2013 to 2015, I created a new summer program for our local Ed Foundation. And uh, I included a whole bunch of art classes. I added a new music camp to it. There was some theater happening. It was hugely successful. So obviously there was a need for it. Kids lapped it up. Kids needed it. Um, then in 2016, I worked as program manager at the Community School of Music and Arts. Um, and I just want to move my slides a little bit. This is some of the work done by my students, my art students, uh, in the summer camps and the classes that I've taught. Um, and then this is uh, an exhibition that I organized uh, of student and faculty work at the Community School of Music and Arts when I was the program manager there. So um, along with all this, I had my healing work also going on. That exploration was going on. And so what I ended up doing was in 2017, I went and trained with Dr. Brian Weiss He's world-renowned uh, hypnotherapist, and he uses soul regression therapies to, uh, to help people in a deep way. And then uh, in 2018, I trained with Dr. Linda Backman, who teaches the next level of soul regression therapies. So um, I was able to then start my work with Kinder Way Healing, which is the name of my holistic healing organization. Um, and I picked a, picked a particular artwork of mine to go with it because it's literally like it all came to fruition, you know, with Kinder Way Healing. Um, so I feel that for me personally, I'm at a point where the reason I joined creatives when PJ asked me to join it is because I was at that point where I was wondering, okay, there is, a, there is this artistic part of me and there's the healer part of me. Now, I knew that those two needed to come together. I wanted them to come together, but I didn't know how they would come together. So I just allowed for them to organically come together. And that's when creatives appeared and PJ pulled me in. And in Creatives for Compassionate Communities, I have found that space where my art and healing and spirituality, all of those come together in a really beautiful way. And uh, what's happening with me now is that my sketchbooks are coming out again, my canvases and my paint and all that stuff is coming out and I restarted my, my drawing and art. And I'm very, very excited to see that it's coming from a different space, a space where I am more confident, I am more whole, I'm not traumatized, I'm not overwhelmed. Um, it's coming from a very healed space within me. So I'm very excited to see what happens next. And with that, I'm going to pass this on to PJ. Welcome, PJ. Thank you, Smita. Um, gosh, it's just such an honor to be here, to be able to share our stories with everybody here. Um, I think we all have a similar journey of how to find that connection in our, in our lives. Um, it's that I never thought of myself as a creative person. I, I was just always a, a very, almost a belligerent kid. <laughs> I, I was just so self-confident um, and a tomboy, as you can see on the swing. You know, I really love this uh, picture. I have it in front of me in my bedroom to remind me that this energy and that feeling of buoyancy, of joy, um, yeah, 
that that's where it is. It resides in this body, that little girl that still is in, inside of me. But I have to say that um, this um, confidence was dashed on the very first day of kindergarten, going to public school. And it had a lot to do with um, kids saying, why is your nose flat? How come Ching Chong Chinmin? And all that. There was already the separation that I was feeling and it was like first day of school and I thought school was supposed to be, you know, inclusive or people were to be together. But it was immediately pointed out to me that I was different. And that lingered with me throughout school as not being picked. Um, and and um, to be on certain teams. Um, and of course, uh, there were very, uh, in fact, I think I was one of the only Asians in my school. So of course, I was distinctly different. And it's, it wasn't until only a few years ago that I go, you know, I think I was bullied. <laughs> I didn't really realize it then, but that was bullying. And uh, I harbored that less than, not adequate um, feeling all through my, my uh, public school years. And um, I was starting to get tested about, well, who am I? You know, here I am a wonderful spirit just really enjoying life. And yet when it came to like, who am I? The identity part never revealed itself because there were no other Asian Americans of which I could relate to or understand. Or in school, teachers expected me to represent the Japanese race <laughs> or the culture. What do, they, what do you do at home? Do you eat this kind of food? Da, 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 da. You know, I always felt that I didn't understand the Japanese American experience, the diaspora experience, um, my grandparents coming from Japan, I'm third generation Japanese American, meaning my parents were born here um, in California. And um, it, it was a, a long journey for me. If it were not for civil rights um, movement, it was if it were not for um, learning about um, ethnic studies, about my history, and learning about my parents being incarcerated in camp in World War II because they were Japanese Americans. And um, I realized that my parents harbored some PTSD having been placed into camp. And I don't think they ever acknowledged it, but it was passed on by telling the children like me, don't speak up. Don't, don't stand out, you know, don't rock the boat, which basically made me more shy than I was already feeling uh, after entering kindergarten. And so I didn't understand this part of my heritage, my cultural heritage, at that um, who am I? And, um, my politics started to form because I was starting to question what is right? What is, what is uh, the morality of a war? And it was like during the Vietnam War and um, I, I was an anti-war movement <laughs> activist. And uh, at the same time, the beginning of ethnic studies was starting to emerge um, in uh, college campuses. And that's where I started to hear publicly about my history. And at the same time, at that point of uh, feeling, okay, that's who I am. I saw for the first time a group playing Japanese drums called Taiko. And the first group um, that I saw performing was the San Francisco Taiko Dojo. They use huge drums from Japan. And what was so beautiful was that there were men and women playing these drums um, so evocatively, went so powerfully that it was like immediately, I want to do that. 
I have to do that. It just sprang from my heart like I can feel the vibration. And uh, there was just something there that was a calling. And that was my way of learning about my Japanese American heritage. It was like going through the art, going through the expression, going through the actual playing music, uh, the release, the pure energy, and the pure connection of how you play as an ensemble that um, erased that separation that I felt through growing up as a kid. So I embraced um, playing taiko, became a charter member of San Jose uh, Taiko here in San Jose, California. And uh, the group is already 47 years old. So I've been playing for 47 years. And uh, I left the company as artistic director um, in 2011. So that's already nine years ago. Um, there is repertoire that I had created while I was with San Jose Taiko. And something that is very instinctive about uh, art expression. Uh, it's embodied wisdom. It's like something inside of you that you don't have to articulate through your head. I do this because of this and this and this. It's like you feel energy. And so that's what I feel that art is. Art is energy. We are the vessels of energy of expression. And so for me, uh, one of the things that I really wanted to do was not only play uh, the drums, but movement. So San Jose Taiko really took um, the pioneering uh, way of how do I get more innovative with movement? How do I integrate something from culture that is so intrinsically there, like uh, a lot of indigenous cultures don't separate dance and song from the drum. You know, it's all integrated. And as I was trying to um, play taiko here in the United States, very, very beginning years was very taiko centric. It was very much about playing the drums and playing music. And when I felt that my body wants to move <laughs> just to something organically with a very simple rhythm pattern. Um, I said, that's it. That's what's missing <laughs> in this expression of um, Taiko here is that we're separating the song, the rhythm and the dance, you know, with, with, with the percussion. And uh, so I decided like, oh, I need to create something like Obon. Obon is the summer festival, uh, Buddhist summer festival, where people come together and they dance and you hear the music and you just dance all night long. And I really wanted to integrate more of the taiko with the dance. And I created this dance called A Janaika. It means, isn't it good? And um, that's something that is inside your heart that you already know that everything is good. Des despite hardship, despite challenge, you know, and you can feel that joy come out when you rise to your feet and you start moving. You know, you're not thinking from your head, you're moving. It's that embodied intelligence, that embodied wisdom, and that you look around and you see everybody's eyes start to sparkle. It's that coming together of a community. It's that connection. And so um, surprisingly, <laughs> I, was, I created this dance just for San Jose Taiko, but then it got absorbed into the community here in San Jose, San Jose Japantown, one of only three Japantowns remaining in the whole United States that is still geographically Japantown, that um, I was invited to share this dance with Obon Festival. From that point on, <laughs> It's going, pew, pew, 
to all these other Buddhist temples, but it's all for communities and other taiko groups are playing it. It's jumped across the pond. I don't know which side of the pond um, to, to Europe, you know, to Asia, even going back to Japan where, wow, this is phenomenal. You know, this thing that came from San Jose is making its way back to Japan, you know. Um, but what it is, is energy, connection, sense of community, sense of belonging, sense of uh, liberation, freedom. And I um, move on to the next uh, slide. And this is what I'm expressing. The ripples of this song dance called Age and Nika. It has gone around the world where I have found that what each of us are yearning for, especially now in this time of disruption, is people are wanting connection, people wanting healing, people wanting to interact and belong. And if we create opportunities more like this where people can come together, um, this is where the healing begins. So this is my journey and um, it also is my segue into uh, the beginnings of Creatives for Compassionate Communities. Um, I, I'll just kind of start this off, but anybody can jump in on this, Nita and Karen. Um, but for a long, um, actually, Smita, will you go ahead? Would you like to talk about this? Uh Sure. So, um, Creatives for Compassionate Communities came together in, uh, I would say, about mid-2019. Uh, two, uh, and uh, the co-founders are PJ, who's here, and Dana Bainbridge. And Dana is a pastor with Urban Sanctuaries. And uh, she really was looking for a space. So she had a congregation. She was looking for her congregation to engage in more art. She had the spirituality component down and she had, you know, one of the main things about her congregation is that they are uh, politically very involved um, and they want to be a part of change. So um, they had all of those elements. They really were looking to add more art. And um, so Dana and PJ got together and uh, talked about this. And then um, PJ pulled me into this and we all met at Roy's Tea Station and Coffee. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, and we started talking about it and then you know other people joined um karen joined us amari joined us and pear joined us so um i have to say what really um ignited my interest to uh want to work with um pastor bainbridge was the fact that she really wanted to make this um, uh, spiral out into the community. It wasn't just, um, it was not for her church or, were she, or was she trying to recruit members for her church. She wanted to create opportunities where that intersection or nexus of spirituality, art, and activism came together. It's like being able to build our empathy for each other through creativity. And um, what I, I have felt like within the last decade or so, we have not had a needle pointing to what is compassion. I think there, there has been such a, um, a void of kindness <laughs> and empathy and um, what can we do with whatever we have that are that we are um, so passionate about through art? So here we came together, our um, charter members from a 
place of empathy, life experience, and desire to be a catalyst for change, our coalition seeks to engage the local community by merging spirituality, art, and creativity into immersive, life-energizing experiences. And our foundational values, compassion, diversity, art and creativity, accessibility, spirituality, equity, inclusion, hope, and gratefulness. So coming together with this vision is still allowing us to be creative in what we are pulling together. And um, we decided that we were going to have a first physical convening in December of last year where three artists were highlighted. And um, um, there was uh, Smita, uh, Derek Sanderlin, and who, who actually did spoken word and, and writing. Um, and you see here, uh, the, the rocks painting is what Smita did at a workshop. And for me, you can see also the origami paper cranes that I also uh, had a, a breakout group. And we all came together after going out and experiencing the doing. And it was such uh, a heartfelt opening time of sharing almost exactly the same experience that we had separately in these breakouts. Um, but Smita and Karen, would and, you like to add? And if I may, PJ, um, just to talk about that, uh, that event that we held, that first um, mini retreat, it was such a great opportunity to come together as community, right? So that uh, when we began the day, uh, we began in circle, right? Which is a, a very traditional way of beginning uh, any gathering and particularly a creative gathering so that you can look around and see the faces of everyone who's there in community together. Uh, we began then the entire day with um, uh, a rhythm circle. So everyone contributed to what became essentially a, a symphony of rhythm um, so that we all feel our heartbeats, uh, feel ourselves vibrating together uh, to create a symphony of rhythm, getting our, our blood pumping and our minds going and, and just knowing that we had arrived in the same space together. So that then for us to be able to uh, head off in different directions to the, uh, the different activities of our choosing, whether that was uh, making the paper cranes or painting the rocks or uh, composing words, lyrics, stories, poetry, when we were all able to come together, because we had developed that community up front, the sharing was really rich and deep. And it was an opportunity for people to speak about what that experience of connecting with creativity while in community did for them and how it made them feel being in this space with one another. And it was a very, very powerful activity. And, uh, and then the hope, of course, was to continue to move on and hold uh, multiple quarterly mini retreats, we call them. Uh, and then the pandemic struck. And so we moved on from the, the format of gathering in person and having multiple different um, activities to instead having a single focus at an event that we could do online. Uh, and so in June of this year, we came together for our workshop that uh, we called Circles of Fierce Love and Compassion, Healing Communities with Bright Word Mandalas. And in that activity, PJ led us through her personal history with mandala and um, how it puts into practice her philosophy that where intention goes, energy flows. And so everyone had the opportunity in their own space and time to be able to uh, create mandalas with their intention, their individual intention. 
Um, we really worked hard to make sure that it was an accessible activity, that it was an activity that uh, didn't require you to have any special materials uh, or any skills that you had in particular in advance, but that uh, as long as you could join us somewhere, somehow, and in fact, um, we had it broadcast on the local television stations as well, that you could participate in the art activity. Because again, philosophically, we believe that this uh, opportunity is there for everyone, that everyone has not only a right, but a need to create and to, uh, to connect with the creative within, which is what allows us to build compassionate communities outside of ourselves. And, uh, and so we have people joining us from, from all over, as I mentioned that, you know, the, the drawback of being virtual is not being able to, to gather in community together or to have multiple simultaneous activities. Um, but the bonus is that people could join us from all over. They didn't have to be uh, physically present where we were to be able to engage. And so then uh, from there, we, we uh, leapt ahead to our most recent event, which was just held last week, a week and a half ago. <laughs> Uh, which was um, our stories of strength and hope, engaging our artistry to envision a brighter future. And that was an activity that um, engaged people in the process of viewing images um, of uh, either challenging situations or um, rundown locations, uh, really images that were calling out for transformation. And we asked our participants what can you imagine happening in this moment to transform this place, to transform this conflict, to transform this situation? And, uh, and so everyone was able to engage their creativity and come up with an outcome that was at the nexus of their creativity and their compassion. Uh, and so we will be moving on after this uh, to an activity that we will be hosting in December of this year. Um, details are yet to be um, put out to the community, but uh, rest assured we're working hard at, at making sure that uh, we fulfill our, our mission of connecting our empathy and our compassion with our creativity to be able to be accessible to our community and welcome them into the creative process. Yeah, and and everybody is invited to these workshops. They are uh, completely free of charge. And uh, anyone, you know, whether it's healthcare workers or anybody here also is welcome to email us, let us know of their interest, and we will send them an invitation so they can participate. Um, one of the better and really wonderful side effects of what we do is that it's the sense of healing and the sense of connection personally for me that I feel when I engage with this group. And um, uh, I would like everybody to experience that. So, yeah. I'd like to add <laughs> that um, the, the coming together of the three of us here on this panel and the, our other creatives for compassionate communities. Um, basically, we kind of really were very passionate about this drive for building compassionate communities. We believed in the art uh, or expression to be at fundamental, uh, to be available to everybody, and how can we share that? And also, we were going into this thinking we don't just want to start another organization or just another club. It's like we also want to share another way of building um, ways of working across sectors and uh, inviting that and encouraging that we just don't go back into the ways of siloing ourselves and, and just do our own thing in our own organization. That once we come out of this pandemic, we're gonna be looking at a, a different way of what community is. And it is just uh, so empowering 
to know that anybody can do this. Just because we were very passionate about it, coming together, and there's that energy there that's kind of already trusting on building on that. And uh, what we are calling this is like we are incubators and that each of us are incubators and we have our own network of reaching out. And we also are thinking of this like a beehive. This is a, an idea that I thought is a metaphor. B, capital B, capital E. B uh, is build empathy hive, like beehives. And you know, when you think about a hive, what happens in a hive? The bees are out there and they come together and there's pollination and cross-pollination. And what do they produce? Something for everybody, the honey, you know? And it's already you coming together with, um, without uh, already knowing that you are building upon a culture of respect and knowing how to work with each other. So uh, we think and like to help people and encourage people to think that these creatives for compassionate communities can be built anywhere and that um, this is what we want to start implanting into our uh, livelihood, our, our lifestyles as we go forward from here. That is why... So I think um, because we've, we've just got uh, about seven minutes left, I think, mm -hmm. and so um, I don't know whether people have questions that they would like to pose to us. If you want to put them in the Q&A, um, that would be a great opportunity for us to see what you have to say or what you are interested in, and then uh, any one of us could address any of the questions that anyone might have. Does anyone have any questions? Um, okay, there's a question from Andreas. So inspiring. How could I reach one of these speakers to be involved too? <laughs> you, can, you can reach us at um, info at here, I think I should type it. I, I, I'll go ahead and put it in the chat. Okay, um, okay. Yeah, but it's, uh, it's info at compassionatecreatives.com. And we do have a Facebook page, so look us up on Facebook. It's uh, Creatives for Compassionate Communities. And uh, we are all very accessible. You can reach any of us. Um, we are available to organize, help you organize. If you want to start your own uh, group that would like to do, assist you in that as well. Um, I see one more question coming in about um, overall goal and any activities focused specifically for kids. So, so far, um, the activities that we have done have actually included every age group. So kids are welcome to, um, in the mandala uh, activity, we did have a five-year-old who had joined. And uh, so I think kids, as the, being an art teacher, I can tell you that every art activity that we've done so far can be done by a kid at whatever level they are at. So it is all inclusive. Any age group can join. Hi, I'm Sejal and I used to be a volunteer with Kids and Art Foundation. I'm now the operations manager here at Kids and Art. Uh, if you'd like a session, please do consider a donation or consider being a sustaining donor and help us with our mission art heals for all pediatric patients thank you